Okay, good morning everyone. I hope you are excited to be uh, here for another day and hopefully um, you'll, um, you'll feel uh, good about participating, asking questions. If you have any questions, please raise your hand while I'm talking, stop me. Uh, I'll be happy to, uh, to provide more details if I have them or try to answer your questions. So let's, uh, let's try to make it as, uh, as uh, informal as possible. Okay, so what I want to do um, before to, uh, to start talking about prioritization is to um, remind ourselves a little bit what we've talked about so far in terms of, uh, of protected areas. Because there were uh, discussions about protected areas pretty much every day since, uh, since we started this, this course. So what we discussed, one point that was made uh, previously in the previous uh, days was that uh, historically protected areas were not necessarily established to uh, protect biodiversity or conserve biodiversity. They had different scopes, different uh, motives for, uh, for becoming uh, uh, protected areas, not necessarily conservation of biodiversity. So um, one is one very common uh, reason for having a protected area um, 200 years ago, 100 years ago, uh, even 50 years ago, scenery, uh, recreation. Um, so various, uh, various um, reasons, again, not necessarily to, uh, to conserve uh, diversity. Here's an example that I like um, to show to my students to illustrate this. So in the United States, um, uh, an analysis looked, la looked at percentage of land uh, that is uh, in conservation areas in the United States by uh, uh, soil productivity. So what we see is that uh, most of the uh, protected, protected areas overlap with least productive soils. And if we think about this historically, this makes sense because uh, in the uh, United States, the most productive soils are in the Great Plains. And that's where, uh, where the um, agriculture um, and cattle raising and whatnot um, took, took hold from the uh, early uh, stages of uh, Western um, colonization. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so what we <coughs> see is that um, in, this for, in this example for, from United States, least productive soils are usually protected. Uh, most productive soils are not because they are they are productive, so I, we are using them for, for agriculture. Now, another way of, uh, or another uh, point to make about um, protected areas, again, in this idea that protected areas were not established to, to conserve a certain uh, property of, of the ecosystems. Uh, this graph shows elevation and, the, and then, again, percentage of land in conservation areas. And what we see is higher elevation are uh, usually, or by 33 plus 12%, uh, higher elevations are protected uh, more so than lower elevations. And that has to do probably with scenery. Also, lower elevations, that's where, uh, again, we have uh, more development, um, easier to develop than, than in at higher elevations. So this point, we've, uh, we made it. I just gave you another, uh, another view on, on this point. Now, one other detail we kept talking about or mentioning, uh, all of us, I think, uh, types, uh, categories of protected areas, the IUCN categories of protected areas, and I just wanted to have somewhere on one presentation uh, have the, uh, the table with the uh, IUCN categories, strict nature reserve, wilderness area. So these, these two are the most, the highest, um, have the highest, let's say, conservation power, uh, national parks too, and then going down uh, the list, we have a more um, diverse activities going on in, uh, in uh, protected areas as we go down this, uh, this uh, category from one to, uh, <coughs> to uh, six. Everybody was uh, um, aware of this uh, classification? Is this new information to some of you maybe? No? Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so um, again, this is a point that has been made, I think. Uh, protected areas have multiple uses, um, and if you remember town, I think town showed a, a slide uh, yesterday with uh, people enjoying skiing in, uh, at a monument, uh, I don't remember the, uh, which one in uh, United States. So yes, protected areas do have uh, multiple uses, and, and sometimes we do ask, uh, are they com uh, compatible? Can we use this uh, um, uh, national monument in the winter to ski and yet 
uh, preserve, I don't know, a wild uh, population of uh, some large mammal. And um, from my personal experience, when I uh, came to the United States, uh, six months after I, I started my master's, I had the privilege to go to Yellowstone with, with my friend, my American friend. And I was completely blown away when I got to Yellowstone and I saw the masses and masses of people. Because in Romania, national parks are not very easily accessible. You have to, uh, well, now you can go by, by car pretty close, but then you still have to hike into a park for most, uh, for most uh, of the uh, parks we have. So again, high altitude scenery, not necessarily biodiversity uh, rich, but that's how historic, historically uh, national parks were created. So my view of national parks was very few people, completely wild, uh, and solitude, uh, finding solitude in national parks. Well, Yellowstone is not like that. Uh, so what you see in Yellowstone, the main roads are crowded, crowded with uh, people. And yet, if we think, uh, if we look for uh, some numbers in terms of wildlife conservation, what we see is that uh, one of the most iconic uh, uh, animals in Yellowstone, uh, grizzly bears, in 1975 there were 136, and now, uh, well, in 2014, uh, 839. So uh, a, a very <laughs> signifi uh, significant or a great increase in population size uh, of gris grizzly bears. And actually this is not just in uh, Nash uh, Yellowstone National Park, but in this greater area, uh, Yellowstone greater area that has the, the core uh, Yellowstone National Park, Great Tetons, and um, uh, a network of national forests. So in this, in this area, the grizzly bear population has increased um, significantly, and yet there is so much, uh, uh, I guess, uh, recreation activity going on. Yes, Lee? At the moment, just as long as we have that map up. Yes. When we talked the other day about, when we talked the other day about wine suitability coming into the Yellowstone to Yukon ecosystem, this is the lower right-hand corner of the Yellowstone to Yukon ecosystem. You can see the dark green areas are Yellowstone, the national parks, the light green areas are national forests, and then the white areas in between are uh, generally ranch lands. And so, and this is a, those white areas are exactly the areas that wine suitability is increasing mm. in. So this, you know, is a place with grizzly bears and elk and deer. <laughs> you don't think about it as a place where you'd have wine, but wine is coming in here and will radically change the ability of grizzlies and other animals to get across uh, uh, between these protected forests and national parks. Sorry. Okay. No, that's great, thank you. Yes, yeah, so um, this is a point I wanted to make. Let's not, let's not imagine national parks and protected areas uh, exclusively for uh, this one objective, uh, conservation of biodiversity. First of all, because they were not initially um, uh, uh, designed for that purpose and in fact uh, uh, in, uh, the first national park in the United States, uh, Yellowstone, uh, the, the mission for that park when it was established, it was for the enjoyment and, and benefit of people. It had nothing to do with grizzlies, uh, 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 I want to say buffalo but not buffalo, bison, bison thank you. Um, so anyway, so I wanted to make sure that this point is out there uh, we can do conservation, uh, we can have multiple uses for a protected area and still be successful uh, for conservation purposes. <coughs> okay, now what has been seen in recent years is uh, a decline, in uh, and we saw, again, we saw that, uh, Bilal showed us uh, the graph with protected areas established by year, and we see that after, I don't remember, maybe 2009 or so, we see a drop in the uh, addition of protected areas. Um, I don't know if it was addition, Bilal. Was it addition of protected areas or it was total? Protected areas by year. So, so cumulative. Yeah. No, not cumulative. not cumulative. Okay, okay, addition. But in any case, this uh, this point that I'm trying to make here is that besides the fact that we are not adding fast as fast as we did in the past, we are not adding protected areas possibly because we are running out of space uh, that is not occupied or is not heavily used. 
Uh, but besides the uh, decline in addition of new protected areas, what we are see we, we've been seeing in re recent years is also a re uh, reduction in the uh, number of protected areas or size of uh, protected areas. In other words, protected areas that had been um, designated as protected areas in the past, some of them have been uh, reassigned, moved out of uh, IUCN category and pretty much lost their uh, conservation sta status. Um, the other uh, tre trend of this uh, um, size of protected areas has to do with um, re reassigning uh, borders and uh, sometimes shrinking, uh, reducing the size of a protected area instead of increasing the size of the protected area. So we've seen this in recent years. We also have seen funding going down. Oh, yes. Yeah, Okay. Uh, so funding going down and threats to those parks and those uh, ecosystems not necessarily uh, necessarily addressed. And and this res recent trend is not um, is quite. We can find um, situations like this in uh, different parts of the world, uh, developed and developing. So, back to Lee. Yeah, I just wanted to add here as we're talking about protected area categories and trends in protected areas. It was announced yesterday or the day before that IUCN, who, as you know, uh, uh, produces the red list of endangered species, has just announced a new list that they're going to promulgate, which is called the Green List of Protected Areas, which are protected areas that are well protected and uh, meet social justice criteria. So a very interesting development in terms of uh, protected area categorization and evaluating the effectiveness and social justice aspects of protected areas. That's great. Okay, thank you. Um, and this, um, this point of um, reducing the size, reducing the number, and not having um, uh, enough funding and not addressing trends was uh, reviewed in a paper uh, that was published in 2014 in Nature. And this paper, um, reviewed protected areas across the world, not, uh, obviously not all 110,000 or 5,000 protected areas, but certain uh, regions across the world. Uh, the authors um, analyzed uh, specific protected areas and um, summarized threats and uh, just trends in general observed across the world. So I want to start with the, uh, the countries we think have most money for conservation and uh, be at least I was surprised. For example, uh, and I'm, I'm not sure you can read in the back, so I'm, I'm gonna read the slide. <laughs> so for example, in the in United States, what's happening is that the National Park um, has been uh, experiencing um, budget cuts to the point, to the point that um, um, maintain maintenance, maintenance, sorry, has uh, deferred maintenance, um, has a backlog now of estimated nine to 13 billion dollars. So this means that the national park system in United States is short of anywhere between nine and 13 billion dollars uh, in terms of uh, maintenance. Now in Canada, uh, and again I'm gonna read the little uh, blurb there, in Canada um, um, the budgets have been re reduced, conservation budgets ha have been reduced by 15 percent and that has generated a loss of 33 percent in conservation staff and over 30% in scientific staff. So these are very sobering, serious uh, news uh, that have to do with uh, budget cuts uh, in developed countries um, and uh, problems that we can uh, foresee and we can, uh, we can predict with such a long uh, backlog of maintenance with reduction of scientific staff uh, we can um, predict that uh, things will not look uh, too bright uh, in the near future. And then there are cases, uh, there are other examples from uh, other parts of the world. Uh, I'll just uh, pick one from Africa. West Africa, a 2014 review of parks managing lion populations finds half of the parks with management plans have no money to implement them. So we have plans, but we don't have, we actually don't have funding. We have the, the data, the science is there, the enthusiasm maybe is there, 
uh, but we, without funding, there's not much we can do. So these are, these are serious concerns that are not local in nature. Well, they are local in nature, nature but they are spread across, across the world. And um, it's something to consider. And I don't know, I, I tend to, be, to get worried when I read these kinds of uh, reviews. Uh, there is a lot more bad news. Uh, I will uh, let you um, review it at your own leisure. Uh, I'll, I'll provide this paper and, of course, the slides uh, for you. Or town will. So, um, not good news. Uh, in this uh, climate of not good news, why should we, pro uh, why should we, sh why should we propose new, uh, new uh, protected areas? Well, if we think about how conservation works, uh, we have, um, we first identify a conservation uh, target. It can be um, a population we need to conserve, a species, habitats, ecosystem services. So we have a conservation target and then we, we, we uh, devise uh, conservation goals um, and hopefully the conservation goals have measurable objectives and we formulate those objectives and we uh, have a way of quantitatively measure the success of our, our actions. But these two, uh, identifying a target and then uh, formulating conservation goals and objectives that can be quantified, these then take us to the need of establishing protected areas or some form of uh, conservation, land conservation, to meet these objectives that we uh, formulate. So yeah, we, we do have the need of uh, new protected areas and maybe uh, think about protected areas in a broad, uh, broad sense, not, of course, not a national park or anything uh, that serious. Just an area that we set aside or we manage with the idea of um, a conservation uh, goal. Okay, so now we are, this was just a background and a little bit of review um, of some topics that you are, you are familiar with and topics that we've uh, already talked about. Um, and now we are um, switching to uh, talking about uh, principles of uh, place prioritization. And I wanted to start by pointing out that there is a very good paper um, that was published in 2000. It's a review paper, uh, and it was published in Science, if I remember, uh, in Nature, if I remember well. I should have put that here. Oh, yeah, over there. Sorry, <laughs> it's over there. Um, and one uh, one point that the authors make is that uh, conservation goals require uh, strategies for managing whole landscape, including areas allocated to both production and protection. So the dual uh, purpose uh, of protected areas is, is stated very first st sentence in the abstract of this paper. We want uh, to make sure that we protect but at the same time allow some production, allow some, uh, some um, sustainable use of resources. Bilal is not listening. And then um, another point that the authors make, make is that um, existing reserve systems throughout the world uh, contain a biased sample of biodiversity. And this goes back to the background I just gave you, the way uh, protected areas have been established in the past. Okay, so when we, we, have, uh, we embark in a place prioritization project, uh, we, the, the two general objectives we should have, or we generally have in mind are, we uh, want to uh, establish or identify a set of reserves, a set of protected areas, possible protected areas, that uh, represent the biotic diversity, however you define the biotic diversity, uh, for, for that particular region. So it has to be representative of the biotic diversity. Th that network of protected areas or reserves that we end up with has to, um, to, optim to be optimized for uh, a full biotic diversity um, representation. And then we want the protected areas to, uh, to have this persistence characteristic to maintain the populations, the processes, the, the ecological processes, and if all possible, exclude the threats to those uh, populations and processes. So these are two very general objectives, very broad objectives that are embedded uh, generally in all uh, conservation priority, uh, place prioritization uh, projects. So we start with these um, two 
um, two general objectives. Any comments or questions so far? I realize I've been talking for close to 25 minutes now. Okay. Um, so we have we start with these two goals that are maybe purely uh, conservation oriented and uh, biologically oriented, the uh, full biotic rep representation and the uh, persistence of populations and processes. But we do have to remind ourselves that we act and um, and um, 